So I'm Bob Bowman. Uh, I want to welcome you here. And we're going to have a, uh, to welcome back a speaker we had last year. This is uh, Dr. David Smith from the Wright State University. He's in the, uh, what, environmental science and earth science? Earth and, mm -hmm. Some of that combination. Yeah, yeah. 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 Earth and environmental place, science. It's a big long name now. Big long name, yeah. yeah. Uh, it used to be the geology department. Right? It was the late Lamenta geology department. So, uh, <laughs> da uh, David's going to, uh, a year ago, he talked about the great Miami super under river and the rocks and boulders and how that led to the development of Dayton in a lot of ways. <clears throat> but today, uh, he's going to talk about something different that is the hills and dales area of, of South Dayton and, and the role of history there. So, uh, uh, I won't keep you any longer or in suspense. I'm going to welcome, welcome back uh, David Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the mic? Yeah. That sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Bob. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful to be back here. I had such a, a great time last year, and, and I really appreciate the, the wonderful, warm welcome that everybody gave me. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I'm here to talk about the uh, Old Barn Club and the golden age of Hills and Dales Park. So I'm kind of backing off on the science here a little bit tonight. How many of you from, are familiar with Hills and Dales Park? So good, so many of you know where it is, so hopefully you'll recognize some of the street names. I was kind of wondering, so, well, it's, you know, Miami, Hills, you know, but it's, it's good to know that uh, you're familiar with it. So I'm active with the Oakwood Historical Society and Wright State University, as Bob said. Uh, my objectives for tonight are to describe what I consider to be the golden age of Hills and Dales Park, which ran from about the time of the park's uh, beginning in 1907 up through the mid-1920s or so, soon after uh, Mr. Patterson's passing, John H. Patterson, uh, president of NCR. And what I also want to do is talk about how the old barn club, this facility, served as, as the hub of the park's social activities during those golden, uh, during that golden age. Nelson Dales Park, as we know it today, stands in this kind of arcuate pattern that runs uh, to the east from the old Southern Hills neighborhood uh, down the south end of Dayton Country Club, and then it trends to the south as you get into the area to the west of Oakwood. It comes down here to not quite where West Dorothy Lane is. And so what I would like to do is take you on a virtual field trip to right in this area at the, uh, just to the south of the modern day park boundary. So we are going to buckle up and uh, drive to the west off of Far Hills Avenue. We'll uh, go underneath the Ridgeway Road bridge here, familiar landmark there in Kettering. I see some nods, good. Uh, we'll come down the hill a ways, and then as we start to curve off to the right a little bit, across the street from um, Big Hill Road, we're going to slow way down because our objective is this, excuse me, this concrete driveway apron right here on the other side of this slippery when wet sign. So if we pull up to that and look up the embankment, we see kind of this lonely lane leading up off of West Dorothy Lane into the woods. Kind of uh, hard to, uh, to, to notice that sometimes if you're sipping down West Dorothy Lane. And if we look at an aerial view of where we are, it's this lane right here. And so we've come down underneath the bridge and we're turning up, up here. This is private property now, so don't try this at home. <laughs> All right? But we're going to take, uh, we're going to drive up here. And I should mention that we're not only moving through space, but through the mists of time on our field trip today, and if we go back a number of decades, we see that we see the lane right here, back at the time when West Dorothy Lane swung way out this way. This was before the bridge was built and this was realigned. And if we go back a few more years, we, uh, we see this on an old map that was published about 100 years ago. So we're gonna drive up this lane. We are now in what was then Hills and Dales Park. And we see that there's a clubhouse right here. So, pardon me. So we're going to go around to the front where this circular drive area is and examine the front of this clubhouse. And as we do, we're going to say hi to these pretty ladies 
enjoying themselves out on the clubhouse lawn. And then we'll go around and park in this circular drive. So here's our clubhouse. Uh, this is an enormous facility, three levels. There's a kitchen here, uh, dorms up here where, where girls can stay overnight. And our objective is the second floor meeting room. So we're going to go up here, the main entrance, go up the steps, go in, uh, in here, and take a left and go into this meeting room. So here's our meeting room. We have some nice natural light coming through, uh, courtesy of a skylight that's cut in the roof above us here. And then there's a balcony area around that off of which these, these, uh, these bedrooms are. So I'd like to invite you to make yourselves comfortable in one of these nice wicker chairs while I say a few things about the history of the area. We are in Hills and Dales Park, named because it has hills as well as hollows, dales, dells, hollers, as some of my kid folk call them. And that is an expression of the geology of the area. So if you were here last time, you heard me say a few things about the bedrock geology being pretty irregular in this area, uh, having ancient river channels cutting through it, but then the glaciers came during the ice ages and dumped a bunch of stuff over top, and so there's uh, over an irregular surface already, there's these, these various landforms associated with glaciation, uh, which is a, a brief look at, a brief examination of why the topography is so variable in there. Glaciers occurred uh, during the ice ages when these enormous sheets of ice came down from the north and then after they finally retreated, life came back to the area. And so the, 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 uh, the, the grasses, the trees, the critters, the deer, the morel mushrooms that pop up in Hills and Hills Park once in a while. Keep that very close to the vast <laughs> where those are. Um, life came back. Uh, they would have established Deer paths, which became human footpaths, bridle paths, roads later on. And the first people that were in Hills and Dales Park were probably some of the mound builder tribes. Uh, you may know that over in Calvary Cemetery nearby, there was an extensive network of, of uh, landforms there. A couple of those still stand. Uh, over in West Oakwood, there was an Indian mound, and these, these mounds were... Typically, these tribes typically concentrated probably along the rivers in Ohio. Uh, I've heard some secondhand stories of people finding points and stone tools in Hills and Hills Park, so undoubtedly some of these people lived there. The uh, first person of European, one of the earliest people of, of European descent to settle into the area was Colonel Robert Patterson, John Henry Patterson's grandfather, who came up from Lexington and eventually became a large uh, a holder of large amounts of land to the south of Dayton. This is his Rubicon farm area looking south. Uh, this is a 19th century image looking into the area where the National Cash Register complex would later be. So Brown Street over here, Main Street over here. This is the five, what was, what's now the Five Points area of Oakwood called Flat Iron Point. A few other landmarks in here including the Patterson Elm, this was a large, enormous ancient tree that marked the uh, kind of the northern boundary of the farm. This elm tree still stood right here uh, across the area from where Holy Angels Church is after Mr. Colonel Patterson's grandson, John H., built his NCR factory complex there. Uh, he, among the, uh, the, the nice features, is that he wanted to have it nicely landscaped in that area, so he called in the Olmsted brothers to help him with that. These were the heirs to the Frederick Olmsted Sr. firm. Fred Sr. designed Central Park and many other areas around the country, and his sons carried on the, his and their father's tradition of landscaping areas to kind of preserve a natural feel and, and nice natural feel of the lay of the land in these areas. So Mr. Patterson mainly worked with John Charles, who helped him uh, with on, on a consulting, consulted him on a number of sites, including Mr. Patterson's Far Hills Estate up on high ground in Oakwood, overlooking the NCR complex. Mr. Patterson enjoyed vacationing in the Adirondack area of upstate New York, and he brought back with him to Dayton and interest in, in kind of bringing home the, the, the feel of that area and some, some of the architecture. So he, uh, the Olmsteads helped him design and build 
a camp right across the street, a little ways to the south from his house. He wanted to teach his children how to cook in the outdoors, and so he built this campsite, picnic shelter, and this lean-to uh, style shelter. Uh, and this quickly became kind of a favorite gathering spot for some of the guests at, at, at the Far Hills. Keep this uh, design of this lean-to shelter in mind. We're going to see that. That served as sort of a prototype for some of the camp shelters in Hills and Hills Park. Early newspaper article from 1907 mentions wild roses are in bloom at Hills and Hills Park, and great credit is due Mr. Olmsted, John Charles, for planting the roads and planting the shrubbery in the park. So Hills and Hills Park, when it opened around 1907, was quite large. This uh, fine line marks the boundaries. If we embolden that a little bit, you see just how big the park was during that time frame. It extended and in, uh, uh, included the area that we're familiar with now, but it also extended well to the south uh, between uh, what was then Lebanon Pike all the way out to Dixie Highway. So much larger than it is today. And if we superimpose that on a modern map, you get a feel for just how big the park was back then. This is the boundary of it now, but back then it was you know, enormous. It included this area to the um, east of Ridgeway Road, all the way down into this area where Mr. Kettering's property is, over by the Southern Hills neighborhood, and a little bit into the Dayton Country Club area. So very large park at that, at, uh, during that time. Mr. Patterson's interest in this area stemmed in part from his interest in horseback riding. You may have heard stories about he, how much he liked horseback riding and how he kind of made his executives learn how to handle and manage horses, uh, much to Charles Kettering's chagrin. Uh, and so he loved exploring this area uh, around Oakwood and especially this area that, that became Hills and Hills Park. This is back in the time when, they, when, the, when the area was pretty wild and wooly. This is, this is remote countryside. Dayton standing well to the north. Uh, not long, this was not long after the, not too long after the first pioneers came to the area and kind of clear cut the land for farming. And back the, in the, oh, this image I think is from about 1912, 1913 or so. You can see there's just a few scattered houses and, and farms. East Oakwood was, was open farmland, the tiny village of Oakwood up here. And again, this is, this is just kind of wide open countryside. So Mr. Patterson uh, enjoyed exploring this kind of high ground out in here. And he decided that he wanted to purchase the land and preserve it as a park. And so at that time, uh, the Silzels, the O'Neill family owned some of this. So he had some of his guys sort of on the side Buy, start buying up some of this land. He didn't want anybody to know that somebody with deep pockets was interested. So he kind of had, you know, sort of his agents do it. This area here where the Silzel property was uh, had formerly for, for many decades belonged to a family named Koblenz. And so when he bought this property, people still referred to it as the old Koblenz farm. Here's a newspaper image showing Part of the farm property, you can't see it very well, but back behind these trees there was a, a nice two-story house on a rise and then a, a barn, an enormous barn, over here off to the west on the edge of about where the uh, community golf course uh, grounds are as, a, as, a, as you kind of come up in the hill. So this barn was built into a hill. This is a modern day view of about the same perspective. We're looking north along Patterson Boulevard about at the intersection of West Dorothy Lane, and there's a house up here on some high ground that stands uh, about where this old house stood, and then the barn over on the edge of the golf course. This large barn was built in what's called the bank barn style, which is very common in this area, where you, you have uh, kind of three levels. You have maybe a hayloft at the top, uh, a large area uh, on kind of the main floor where wagons can kind of come and go. And then an area underneath for housing animals. It's typically open to some kind of a feeding lot where the animals can kind of come and go. So this was sort of the, this is pretty much the basic style of this barn. Well, after Mr. Patterson bought the property, he ordered the barn moved intact and joined to the farmhouse on the farmhouse's west side. So he had his guys strip the siding off of this barn and presumably with, with animal power, drag the framework up to the hillside, 
fixed it to the west side of his house, and then they put the, the siding back on and kind of fixed it up nice. The first floor of the barn was uh, cleared of partitions and now forms the main floor of this clubhouse that we're looking at. And so this is the floor plan uh, here. It was, here's the barn side. Here's the house side here, formed kind of this L shape. Here it is from the back. Here's the barn side over here with our skylight and then this nice two-story house with these gables up on the third floor. Windows were cut on all three sides, commanding a superb view of the valley. And so there were indeed, we were up on high ground, so it had a nice view to the north, a beautiful look to uh, a view off to the northwest across the area where the golf course is now. And then to the southwest, a look along Dorothy Lane into the area where Mr. Kettering's property was. So Kettering Hospital and the new cancer center are back in this area. We'll talk about this image in a little more detail in just a moment. A large fireplace was built on the east side, east side of the room and connecting doors open to the dwelling house beyond. So here's what it looked like when it was finished. Here's a, a view to the front of the uh, facility and then we're looking to the uh, from kind of the air on the back here. All indications I've seen are that Mr. Patterson originally intended this to be sort of a country, remote country version of the officers club that he had for his guys down on the, uh, the main NCR factory complex. And so kind of a retreat for them out in the country. But it soon seemed, to, from what I gather, it turned into more of a kind of a community gathering place. The first newspaper story I can find about it mentions that in 1908, uh, some of the groups scattered citizens of, of, Ket of excuse me, Van Buren Township and Oakwood uh, met there at the clubhouse right up in this area to discuss a taxation amendment. So, so just normal folk uh, from the, the community started gathering there. In 1910, the newly formed Dayton Automobile Club leased the clubhouse from NCR. Back then, of course, automobile ownership was, was fairly rare. Uh, and the few, some of the few people that had automobiles in Dayton formed a, a club. They had an uh, office in downtown Dayton at one of the old hotels, and then they had this, this remote country retreat that they could go to for the gathering. So here's some of them posed in front of the, uh, the auto club with, the, with a couple of their cars. Newspaper article from that same year mentions the Dayton Automobile Country Club has become an exceptionally popular gathering place for motorists and their parties, and each noon and evening at the handsome clubhouse is enlivened with luncheon and dinner parties. So it sounds like a nice place to go out in the country and have a little bit of fun. That same issue of the newspaper said Mr. and Mrs. Edward Deeds had formally entertained a few friends at a luncheon there. Of course, they live nearby in the area where, where Moraine Farm is now. The Dayton Automobile Country Club published two or three magazines and included some nice pictures showing the, the beauty there in Hills and Hills Park, promoting it a little bit. The largest gathering that took there when it was the Auto Club was in 1912 when a group of motorists, uh, also automobile owners from Cincinnati, formed a caravan of 192 cars and came up from Cincinnati to a big party at their Dayton comrades, uh, colleagues, clubhouse. And so they had the, the clubhouse decorated with, with flags and banners and streamers, welcoming their guests from the Queen City. And then they, and they served them a, a chicken dinner in the main dining room, excuse me, main dining room of the clubhouse here, as well as on the, the tents on the lawn. So a big, big party at the clubhouse for their guests from Cincinnati. And here's the party breaking up. So they're saying goodbye. They're, someone took a picture from the second story of the, of the clubhouse, and here they are getting into their cars. And this photo was made of the lead car going back out on the, uh, Dorothy Lane with lots of hoopla and shouting and yelling as they, uh, the, they began their trip back south. This is at the intersection of Patterson and Dorothy Lane, and again, some evidence of Mr. Patterson's interest in that Adirondack style. He had these, these gateways up in several areas in uh, uh, some of the properties he owned. 
Over here in the background is a, a, a waiting station for the electric railroad that served that area. Uh, in a newspaper article from 1911 mentions that on July 4, the cars of the Hills and Dales Railway will connect with the Ohio Electric Railway at O'Neill's which is down here. This is the area where the Golden Nugget Pancake House is now at Dorothy Lane in Dixie. And so these electric rail cars came up Dorothy Lane to the NCR Country Club, which was here where community golf course is now. There was a waiting room that served that. This was, of course, later uh, community golf course. And then NCR Country Club moved its way to the south. And then it also came up the hill to within um, 1,000 feet of the Automobile Country Club to our waiting station here uh, that we saw in the background. This was an early effort of the Dayton Power and Light Company, by the way. So here's that, that waiting room that served the, this clubhouse. Another way to get into Hills and Dales Park was to take the, elect the Oakwood Electric Railway up to the loop at five points and, uh, pardon me, I'm having a hard time with this clicker, uh, would, uh, you could D-board there and walk into Hills and Dales Park. And this route is described in a, a passage from this Oakwood book, quoting an old newspaper article from 1912. It was this period that the Willow Tea House, a good place to stop and rest, was advertised in the local paper. To get there, one took the Oakwood car to the loop at what is now five, point, five points, and then walked two-thirds of a mile. The walk will do you good. <laughs> The tea house is about halfway between the Oakwood Loop and Adirondack Camp, and one third of the way to the NCR Country Club, present day community golf course. Open all the time except Sunday morning. So there's this little tea house here, and here's, uh, here's the menu of what you could, uh, some of the, the, the snacks and the light meals you could enjoy there. <laughs> This stood over in West Oakwood. Uh, this is a view along Runnymede, if you're familiar with that, West Oakwood. So it stood in this area. Uh, this was also pictured in this uh, newspaper article from 1912, uh, along with the Halfway House, which is another place in, in uh, the park that, that you could stop and get a bite to eat. This article mentions last Sunday afternoon, there were hundreds and hundreds of people walking, driving, horses, or automobiling through hills and dales. And one observer estimated the number who were being served with tea and cakes or soup and wafers at the halfway house, not far from Round Camp, uh, as being almost 100 at one time. So the park was getting very popular during these days. So here's another view of halfway house. And then Round Camp, so halfway house is right here. Uh, in the area where the gazebo and pond are now. And then um, Round Camp was up on a ridge, a tall ridge, uh, just to the west of there. And if we look at that on a modern map, here's the, uh, here's the pond and gazebo area, and then Round Camp was up here on the, on the hill. So if you're familiar with the park, there's a public parking spot there, and this uh, halfway house was on this little rise back here. When I, for, for many years there was a, a more modern camp there and they took that down a few years ago when the, uh, the Five Rivers Metro Parks uh, took over the area. Here's another couple images of Round Camp. This was a favorite spot for horseback riders. Here's some riders from Dayton Country Club in their riding apparel and here's a postcard of uh, showing the, the riders along the, the bridle path there. If you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, you may see that some of the figures here are still in black and white, so the hand tenor of this postcard kind of must have gotten tired after a while <laughs> and you know, just kind of left them. <clears throat> and it's hard to overstate the popularity of horseback riding in the park during that time frame. Here's some pictures of people on horseback, and this map we've been referring to, and you get some idea by looking at the legend, the number of the, the top entry on the legend is Bridal Pass, and so lots and lots of people riding horseback in the park. Here's a newspaper article from 1914 talking about the popularity of horseback riding, and one of the favorite stops was this log trough 
that stood just to the south of our clubhouse. There was a natural spring coming in from the hillside, and somebody put a log there and I guess hollowed it out a little bit or carved it, and it made a natural drinking trough where horses could stop and get a bite to uh, uh, get a drink. This was so popular that this early map shows the, the log trough there at the just to the south of our clubhouse there at, at uh, Patterson and, and Dorothy Lane. Here's another article from 1912 talking about the growing popularity of horseback riding, and that included a picture of Mr. Patterson and his daughter Dorothy. Mr. Patterson is mounted on Spinner, an exceedingly fine animal. This was his favorite horse and the one that's depicted on the monument there in Hills and Dales Park, Patterson Memorial. It also mentions the work on the riding club at stables at the country club is also progressing nicely. And so there was stables built over at Dayton Country Club in the area where the large parking lot is now. Uh, here's a flyer from 1912 talking about the, the, the progress on the stables and who put up some of the money. So as you look at this list, this is kind of the, the high society there in Oakwood in Van Buren Township at that time, the Pattersons, the Meads, the Talbots. Here are some of them on horseback, and this lady right here is Catherine Haug Talbot, uh, whose name may be familiar to you if you're familiar with the history of the Running Meat Playhouse, yeah. which is one of the predecessors here. She was kind of the matriarch of the Talbot family. More examples of, of, of horse equestrian activity. There's a uh, portion set aside for playing polo. Here's some guys playing polo. Uh, golfers in the golf course. There was a nine hole golf course uh, here in the background in, in, in this hilly area. So there's guys playing golf. This is called horse soccer or push ball. The objective was to push this enormous ball uh, across the goal line at either end of the field. So they're playing that again well uh, with a golf course in that hillier area to the north in the background in those shots. There was a horse show there in 1912 billed as the first local horse show. That may be stretching it a bit, but this is um, uh, again out there on in the area where the golf club is now on the polo grounds. And this is again is some of the, kind of the, the upper crust of, of uh, of Oakwood and Van Buren Township, the, the Deeds family, the Talbots and the Meads uh, parading their horses around. One of the more conspicuous figures on horseback in the park at that time was this man known as Captain Huey, John Huey. He was an ex-NCR um, factory worker who Mr. Patterson hired to be the constable in the park. So he patrolled the park on this enormous horse uh, carried a gun with them, and he made sure that people kept their, you know, minding their P's and Q's at the time. So he kept kept things under control in the park. He was a, a fairly stern figure, but he was also a bird expert. And so, if you wanted to know something, you know, ornithology-wise, there in the park, you could ask Captain Huey. He could tell you all about the birds in the park. Here's an early image of one of the campsites. There was a number of campsites in Hills and Dales Park. This is Round Camp. Again, you can see Mr. Patterson's interest in that Adirondack style expressed here. This was from an early lantern slide, one of these beautiful uh, glass slides that had the image on it. It's uh, probably well over 100 years old. And it's astounding to me how the color is held up on this. But this would have been right after the camp was built. You can see it's in really good shape. Here, this was one of, of many camps. Uh, as I said, a couple of them were round, but most of them had this lean-to style design, like the Far Hills Camp over basically in Mr. Patterson's front yard. And so these were uh, gathering places. They had a fireplace and chimney in the back of these, and there was nine of them scattered. Nine of them, including the Far Hills Camp, throughout the park. Uh, an early newspaper article tells about where they are. White Oak, Polo View, Adirondack, and Round Camps are reached from the Hills and Dales electric rail car to the south, leaving the car at Beck Road and walking east. So you could come down what was then Cincinnati Pike to this stop here and walk, sorry, walk up into the park. If we plot that on a modern map, this is at the intersection of what's called uh, Glenbach Street there in Kettering. And this is, again, a gold nugget pancake house food reference for you. This is where the, the uh, Walmart is. So you can deboard here 
and walked up into the park to those camps. And here they are plotted on this early map. So you can see exactly where those stood in the park. Again, round camp down over in this area. And uh, if we look at that on a modern map, you can see where they were. So these camps were on either side of this water tower. Adirondack <coughs> camp was up here where Adirondack camp still stands, where so this building has been replaced. And then round camp up in the, where the woods here is now. Meanwhile, Far Hills Camp on Mr. Uh, Patterson's home property is reached from the Oakwood car south, leaving the car at the loop. So you could deboard here uh, at this main entrance to Mr. Patterson's property, and he made this camp available to for the public uh, for use there. So you could deboard the Oakwood car, walk up this lane, and come up to the camp up in this area. This camp stood in the in this this right around in here, uh, which is was of course developed in later years. This is where Mr. Patterson's home was, and then this camp uh, shelter stood there. And, and what's interesting is the lean-to shelter was preserved even after the area was developed. They people that, that owned the property there uh, kept it standing. And then a few years ago, through the sorry, the generosity of the Beezer family. Uh, they donated the camp and the funds to move it over to Carolyn Park. So this stands up on high ground at the south end of Carolyn Park, uh, just to the north of where Calvary, uh, the, the northern border with Calvary Cemetery. You can go look at this, this camp. This is the only remaining shelter of these early camp shelters that was preserved. Inspiration and Locust Camps are reached by the Hills and Dales car to the south, leaving the uh, car at what was later called the Hills and Dales Club. So we come up here to the loop at this clubhouse, and Inspiration Camp uh, was up here on high ground in the Locust Camp along this ridge to the south. If we look at a modern map again, Locust Camp up here in the woods, or excuse me, Inspiration Camp up here in the woods, Locust Camp here uh, at the intersection of what's now Locust Camp and uh, Big Hill over in Kettering. If you want to know where Inspiration Point Camp got its name, take a look at the view to the north. This is uh, on high ground looking uh, beautiful view out in the area, um, the rest of uh, the uh, Hills and Dales Park and into West Oakwood. This is a little more modern style, not quite that rustic. Adirondack look to it. This was built a little later. Very simple structure though uh, with, with windows. This camp shelter had windows and then it, it enclosed a fireplace and stone chimney. If you've ever traipsed through the woods over at Hills and Dales Park and wondered what this thing is, well this is that fireplace and chimney to Inspiration Camp. And so you can see the roof line up here uh, on this. Meanwhile, Locust Camp here to the to the south, and this is the this is Locust Camp again, a little more modern look to it, not quite that rustic Adirondack style. On this beautiful high ground here, had this this arbor coming out to the south to a more rustic looking bench. Here's a, another view of that bench. We're looking to the south uh, uh, toward Winding Way road here and this was way up here on this ridge and so Mr. Patterson likes citing these on, on high ground that have this, this pretty overlook for most of them and, and this one was, was no exception. So this overlooked this valley where Southern Boulevard is now. So we are looking from about where Mr. Kettering's originally Terrace House is. Uh, Kettering Hospital is in the foreground here now. We're looking up into Hills and Hills Park. And so this camp shelter would have had this beautiful view down into this area. Finally, um, Hickory Knob Camp and Big Hill Camp were reached from the Hills and Dales car south, leaving the car at the Locust Barns and walking east. So this electric railway came off of West Dorothy Lane, came down Kettering Boulevard, and stopped at was what was called the Locust. Uh, the, this was a collection of... of, of uh, barns and, and farm buildings out here. Uh, you would deboard here, you see the rails in the foreground, and you walk up the street to these two camps. This electric railway came all the way down Southern Boulevard and looped at this station 
uh, just to the north of Stroop Road. And so this is looking at the area where the hospital is now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And if you can just see Mr. Kettering's Ridgely Terrace up here at the top of the hill. It looks like it was planted to a corn or something. Yeah, yeah, rows of, uh, some rows of crops looks like are in there. Uh, so this is where the uh, modern day look of where these, these, these camps stood. This is uh, Kettering Hospital area, Hickory Mount Camp here. Big hill camp way up here at the top of this very big hill that overlooked what's now this Huber development and then Dixie Highway off to the west. So this is big hill camp. Uh, again, that lean-to style, um, the, the fireplace and chimney in the background for cooking, and then just a spectacular view off to the west. These camps can be rented. You go down to NCR to the, what was called the Welfare Department office, back when the name Welfare was still respectable, and uh, put, uh, put your money down. They, they were, you could rent them for a dollar a day and put down a deposit of 50 cents, which you get back after you cleaned everything off and left it nice and tidy. Uh, this newspaper or magazine article uh, discusses some of the camps. These camps each contain rough cooking utensils, a complete set of dishes, a locker filled with potatoes, plenty of salt and pepper, and water both for drinking and washing the dishes. They would have a barrel, a larger barrel off to the side for washing the dishes. There are signs indicating just where everything is to be found, uh, and complete directions for baking the potatoes in the hot sand and ashes in the fireplace. <laughs> Sounds like fun. The cooking outfit even includes wooden forks for toasting marshmallows. These were designed by John H. Patterson himself. In fact, he gave his personal attention to all the details of the camp equipment. And here's some folks having a, a party. This, this, these camps were, were very popular for parties and picnics. Here's some folks enjoying themselves at one of these lean-to uh, shelter-style camps, probably adding Rondack Camp. And here's another view of Round Camp, some folks enjoying themselves there. They got a fire going in the fireplace. Looks like probably these ladies have to do the cooking for the party here. And by then they had some chicken wire up, looked like some nice morning glories uh, growing up there. And if you look through the society column of the newspapers at this time, it's just chock full of these little mentions of the camps. Uh, the girls uh, writes at Big Hill Camp, Round Camp was the scene of a happy gathering. Um, this Anna Liebendorfer hosted a, a party at Adirondack Camp. Uh, the Omer Fair and Register Company at Adirondack Camp, about 90 participated in a party there. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson gave a unique Halloween party at Inspiration Camp in celebration of their first wedding anniversary. Jack-o'-lanterns and weird Halloween symbols were everywhere in evidence. The NBB Club enjoyed a wiener roast at Inspiration Camp Wednesday evening with a comedy sketch by Nick Clark and John Schaefer, who have accepted contracts with the Vaudeville Circuit. So lots of fun, it sounds like, at, at, these, uh, at these campsites, which were very popular gathering places. In 1913, the Dayton Automobile Club, uh, their, their lease expired, and our clubhouse was renamed the NCR Girls Club, where um, uh, girl employees of the National Cash Register Company were given exclusive privileges of the clubhouse and grounds. And so that's the designation that we see this on this map we've been referring to, uh, which was printed probably in 1914 or so. This is a large map that was included in the back of this wonderful book. I mentioned this a little bit last time. Dr. August Firsty was a local geologist and uh, published this wonderful book that Mr. Deeds financed describing the geology of an area around Dayton and Hills and Dales Park. So this, this great map was included in the back and it included some wonderful photographs of the landscape in the South Dayton area before it was widely developed. This is available at, at many of the local libraries. 1915 marked the beginning of Sunday afternoon concerts at our clubhouse. There was a, the grounds in behind it formed kind of a natural amphitheater. There's this curving hillside there 
uh, West Dorothy Lane is in the background here. The little road that we drove up to get here is, is, is back in here. You can see a, a few cars parked along it. Um, and then this is a picture from the clubhouse looking uh, into the area where this, this amphitheater was. It looks like there's a lady playing piano on a stage here, a bunch of people watching her along the hillside. They had a projection booth for moving pictures that they would show out there, probably put up a big screen or a, a sheet or something here for projecting movies. Um, in 1915, the, uh, the, the Girls Club was changed to the Hills and Dales Club, where membership was opened up. Mr. Patterson decided he wanted to have a country club that was accessible to the common folk. And so he opened up membership to all persons of good character. The rates being a dollar per year, 10 cents a day, charged for each guest or children. Luncheons and dinners are served daily in an atmosphere of quiet, Comfort and suburban beauty makes the club a spot where all may congregate for pleasure and rest. So this was open seasonally. It opened up around Memorial Day through the summer and into the fall and, and kind of served people riding horse back in the fall and it would close during you know, October or so. The, uh, the opening for the season in 1916, uh, 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 the, the, day, the Sunday Date Daily News ran an article about the grand opening for that year with pictures of, of the clubhouse and listing some of the advantages of being a member of the Hills and Dales Club, country air, tennis, dancing, parties, picnics, and so forth. Five cent car service continued from downtown Dayton. Um, cars bound for Hills and Dales Club leave 3rd and Main Street at 5.25 a.m., and every 20 minutes thereafter through the day and then return. So the fact that these, these electric rail cars were running that frequently tells you something about how popular the clubhouse was, be, was becoming at the time. And then here's, the, um, here's the, the waiting station designated as Hills and Dales Club. Uh, what else? Excursions, dining pavilion, women stay overnight, special entertainments, and a free sunset. <laughs> In 1917, Mr. Patterson donated the community, uh, what was then the National Cash Register Country Club, to the city of Dayton uh, as a community country club. Again, available open, op op with open up membership. Um, and so this is the uh, this is the clubhouse and and uh, uh, clubhouse area. This is now where the community golf course clubhouse building is. In the following year, 1918, he donated what's pretty much the modern boundaries of Hills and Dales Park to the city of Dayton. 294 acres in all, uh, um, including this, this area back here of Hills and Dales Park beyond the, the area that's the golf course. The stipulation was that he would put up $10,000 a year for the first three years of upkeep to Hills and Dales Park, provided Dayton spent not less than $5,000 per year after 1921. So the city of Dayton took him up on that, and there was a huge dedication in June of 1918. All Daytonians will have a part in dedication. 20,000 people showed up for this. Uh, foreign dignitaries even brought Orville Wright uh, out to the park. He was you know, fairly reclusive, but he came out. Uh, Mr. Patterson himself was overseas on business, but his daughter Dorothy uh, spoke at the dedication. Later that same year, um, uh, Dorothy Patterson, Dorothy Patterson Judah, hosted a dinner and dance for local soldiers from a cook and Wilbur Wright Fields. NCR trucks went out and got these guys, brought them into the Hills and Dales Club for a big party. So uh, lots of people came out for that in 1918. Here's a picture out in front of the clubhouse of people posing for the camera. They were fed, uh, and then they danced. So here they are in a, on the dance pavilion out back of the clubhouse, enjoying themselves. A uh, uh, photograph taken probably from the second story of the clubhouse. And Mr. Patterson was back at that time. So this is him right here in the white suit holding the hat. There's a number of pictures of him posing for the camera with some of the, the soldiers at this party. 
A much larger party was held the following year, 1919, when NCR closed down for a day, and the several thousand employees marched from the NCR factory complex south on Main Street out to uh, the uh, Hills and Hills Park for a, a large party. So they made this march up Main Street, out to the Five Points area, took a left, came into West Oakwood and out into Hills and Hills Park for this gigantic party. 25,000 people, if you can imagine that, crowded in that area where the, where the golf course is now for this huge for this, for this, for this big party. So this is uh, them. This is food and drink out in front of this outdoor kitchen. Uh, these are the the clubhouse buildings that we saw in the postcard there a moment ago, and enormous amounts of food and drink, uh, thousands of gallons of water and and coffee and lemonade. Lots of people, hundreds of people to help serve, prepare and serve the meals. Uh, both lunch and dinner, 30,000 meals at, at each of them. Thousands of pounds of beef and sandwiches, uh, ice cream crackers, and 3,000 pounds of candy for the kids. Did he do that only once? <laughs> I believe just the once, yeah. Well, after it lasted two more years. And they were entertained, and so off. So here's the kitchen area over here, and then there was kind of a carnival set up over in this area. Uh, including sideshow, games, prizes, parades, clowns, fortune tellers, motion pictures, music, dancing, sports. And so there was lots of entertainment, all on Mr. Patterson's dime. So he put up uh, $50,000 in 1919 money. I don't know what that would be now to throw this enormous party for his employees and their families. He was getting on in years, 74, 75, but he made the march from uh, the NCR complex out to, out to the, the party himself, too, where here he is visiting with some of the employees and their family of NCR. During 1919, the Hills and Dales Club was renamed the Old Barn Club. Uh, and basically the same setup was, was included there. It continued to be a delightful spot for that picnic or party. And this ad from one of the NCR magazines uh, promotes the club, the rail car service, the fact that you can have meals and, and make reservations for parties there, uh, and the various other activities. Dormitories for girls can still be rented for part of the entire season as desired. and. Um, uh, and, and again, that was up there on the third floor. It's about this time that some of the old um, automobile club, uh, uh, automobiles uh, barns were turned into riding uh, stables for, for horseback riding. So horseback riding started up there, I believe, about that time. And it was this time frame that the, the clubhouse really hit its stride uh, and, and enormously popular. History of Old Barn Club as interesting as it is brilliant. Average attendance now runs above a thousand each week. Fame of the Old Barn Club extends over this entire country. It's a very popular gathering place. Um, run by, basically by this woman. This was Hattie Schaefer, who was uh, Walter Schaefer's wife. Uh, he was a developer there in Oakwood. She was well known in lo local social circles. And so she was kind of the, the chair of the facility and then she had this board of directors of, of all these women who were in charge of things like membership, Sunday afternoon concerts, literary teas, dances, entertainment, and informal Saturday afternoon talks. Many of those which were uh, arranged by Charlotte Reef Conover. So if you're a student of local history, you may recognize that name. She authored uh, several important books about the early history of Dayton and, and the Patterson family. So she was very active there. The afternoon, Sunday afternoon concerts continued during this time frame. They were enormously popular. Here's another view. Uh, looking in a different direction in that amphitheater in the back, we kind of have our back to West Dorothy Lane. Uh, Patterson Boulevard is over here, maybe 100 yards to our left. Here's the clubhouse here. Here's some performers on stage. Uh, of course, the audience projection booth and the dance pavilion over here. 
the, uh, the newspaper ran the program for each of these concerts, so you could clip this out of the paper and bring it with you. Uh, this uh, article from 1920 about the closing of the, the season mentions the average attendance at the Sunday afternoon concerts was between 600 and 700, although on one Sunday there were 1,500 present and on another 1,200. So this was enormously popular for these musical performances, so much so that they continued them in, the down, in downtown Dayton during the winter months So places like uh, Memorial Hall and NCR Auditorium, they would continue them there. And then back in, even in the spring, when the clubhouse would open up, they'd have them back there in the outside. Well, meanwhile, development was uh, going on in East Oakwood at this time frame. The first development in that, that area of East Oakwood between Shore Air and Far Hills was this Park Hill development. This was just to the south of Mr. Uh, Patterson's Far Hills property here. And if we focus our attention on this corner right here, Patterson and um, Shantz Avenue, this place went up in 1919. So this is construction here, uh, Far Hills um, Estate in the back here. You just catch a glimpse of the Far Hills camp here and the top of the lookout tower down there in the, in the shots part there. And this facility became the Oakwood Village Club, was renamed the East Oakwood Club, and then it was the Oakwood Y when I was a kid. Now it's the Oakwood Community Center. This was run also basically by Mrs. Schaefer. Uh, she was chair and prosperity has so bountifully blessed the old barn club under her direction that the East Oakwood Club, of who she is chair also, is to receive the proceeds of one day of the old barn club's activities. The money will be used for the purchase of needed furnishings at the East Oakwood Clubhouse. So um, this was open year round and many of the types of activities that had been held at the old barn club started to be held here at the, uh, at the East Oakwood Club. Which was open year round. In 1922 a man named Ken Tullis took over operation of the stables at the old barn club. This is him right here. Uh, this is the front of the stables with some of his his crew here posing for the camera. Uh, we're looking uh, in front of about where Patterson uh, Boulevard is now at the main entrance to the stables. He became very well known for teaching equestrianship to children. Uh, this is him on horseback here with a group of kids. And here he is again with some more kids from Dayton Country Club where he also had a presence at the stables there. So he was kind of in two places at once. And, and that was the thing to do, was to ride with King Tullis if you were a, a, a kid a, a living in that area. I've actually had a, two or three people in their 80s tell me, oh yeah, I rode King Tullis and he taught me how not to be afraid of horses. And so it's kind of neat to, to visit with some people who knew him. There was a newspaper article from 1922 mentioning uh, the old barn club from the perspective of a horseback rider. They say, we were out riding the other morning and we stopped in at the old barn club about noon, riding clothes and all. We asked if it were possible to get lunch and found we could be served if we would wait just a little while. Of course you should telephone ahead and make reservations, but this is what we had. Delicious clear bouillon, a half fried chicken, spaghetti with cheese, new peas, Plates of little biscuits and raspberry jam, a salad of cucumber and pineapple and gelatin, and homemade ice cream with chunks of peaches in it and cake. <laughs> you gotta feel sorry for the horses, Karen. <laughs> it was served in a delightfully cool green, white and black dining room with bowls of berries for table decorations. So sounds like a wonderful place. <sighs> In 1922, a newspaper article mentions Johnny Patterson praises the work of the Old Barn Club. The Old Barn Club is like a flower half blown, an old, old poetic term, uh, said Johnny Patterson Friday evening at Far Hills when he entertained the members of the board of directors of the club at dinner and discussed with them plans for the coming summer. I hope that we may live to see it unfolded, for I feel that it will grow 
more and more beautiful each year. And unfortunately, less than two months after saying that, Mr. Patterson did pass on. And I think with him went some of the spirit of, of the old barn club in Hills and Dales Park. He bequeathed his, his, most of his estate to his children, and that included all the land outside of Hills and Dales Park that he had donated to the city, so that uh, the, the uh, large area, including the large area to the south, and then the 16 acre tract of land in Hills and Dales Park on which the old barn club was situated. So soon after that, in the 1920s, as Oakwood started, it was uh, continued to grow. Uh, they began selling off, the, his, his children began selling off land, including some of this very valuable property along Ridgeway Road in uh, West Oakwood. So we are over the top of the old barn club, basically, here looking to our east. And this is uh, East Oakwood. This is Lebanon Pike, modern day Far Hills, right here. Oak Knoll. Dorothy Lane Market, if you're familiar with that, is right about here now. So lots of businesses in this area, and then this is one of the very early houses that went up there uh, along Ridgeway Road after the Patterson Heirs sold the property. This, by the way, is our chimney uh, to Inspiration Point Camp. So the camp shelter was gone by that time, but you can still see the, uh, the chimney there in this aerial photo and the, and the road that wrapped around it. So this, you wouldn't know this is high ground if you go back there now, it's all kind of covered with trees. Um, but uh, it was, here's the chimney and here it is if we zoom in on it a little bit in that picture. The Patterson Memorial was dedicated in May of 1928 uh, to a great crowd that came out here, uh, drove their cars out onto the golf course for this dedication. Uh, this is the early shot of the monument and here's the, uh, here's the, 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 here's Mr. Patterson on his horseback in the sculptor's studio before that went up. Well, by this time, the old barn club over here was not quite the remote country destination that it used to be. Uh, this is a view into East Oakwood here. East Oakwood was growing. Uh, we're looking into the northwest, of course, the NCR area here. Here's the fairgrounds, downtown Dayton, and so Far Hills Avenue here, and the old barn club here. So lots of development going on around it. By that time, a lot of the social activities in the area had shifted over to the East Oakwood Club, and there were other places to go for, for food. Here's some early restaurant ads for uh, places in Oakwood that stood along Far Hills Avenue. And then meanwhile, over on Schroyer Road, just to the south of where the Dairy Queen is now, the, the Schnitzelbank Beer Garden stood there, and you could get uh, some food and drink there. So more options for uh, places to go and eat. Also, by the, the end of the 1920s, 60% of U.S. families own a car. Automobile ownership went uh, uh, up when prices went down. And so with all these, uh, with the availability of automobiles, people weren't limited to just taking the rail cars to where they wanted to go for, for recreation and entertainment. They had lots lots uh, wider options, and this kind of brought in the kind of the golden age of travel and what you associate Route 66 with uh, by that time. So this led to a decline in popularity of the old barn club. Um, the clubhouse was continued, a newspaper article from 1932 mentions the clubhouse was continued in operation until this past summer when it ceased operations. It was never a money-making proposition, but Mr. Patterson did not aim to make it so, and always gladly took care of the deficit. So he looks like he kind of, you know, under 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 rode it a little bit um, while he was alive. And, and here's an article or an ad uh, from the Schartzer Wrecking and Excavation Company. The old barn club in Hills and Dales is now being wrecked, and so they listed all the the furniture and fixtures in this ad that they were selling off before they tore it down. In 1933, uh, a, a stone drinking fountain and horse watering trough was dedicated, built and dedicated at the site where the, the log trough had stood. And so they, they, they took the natural spring and directed it through this. The old barn club would have stood, as you see in this picture, the old barn club would have stood immediately in the background here. And so you can get a drink from this side of it 
and the horses could drink from the trough over here. So this was dedicated at a ceremony attended by Fred Patterson, Mr. Patterson's son, and some of the uh, people in the, in the government of Van Buren Township. This man, by the way, here and here, this is Captain Huey, our friend Captain Huey, uh, who was still constable in the park. He was, I think, in his 80s at this time, uh, but he was still still keeping a lid on things, and he finally, he lived to a, a good, ripe old age. He passed away uh, well into his 90s during the uh, World War II years. Meanwhile, King Tullus continued to operate the riding stables. He had a, an agreement with the Patterson family that as, as long as they held the property, he could continue to uh, do, his, uh, do horseback riding there. So he managed the stables there, also at Dayton Country Club, and here's a picture of some ladies on horseback there at the old barn club stables. It's dated 1938. So he kept a presence there for a number of years until 1940, uh, when the the state, when the, the land there that the old barn club had stood on was uh, sold by the Patterson heirs and subdivided, and houses put up there. So Mr. Tullis uh, took the horses from the old barn club stables and moved them over to the stables at Dayton Country Club, but where he continued to... women are riding astride <laughs> now. Uh -huh. And the other pictures you showed us, those ladies were riding side saddle uh -huh. with uh -huh. their skirts. Yeah, wow. Good eye. <laughs> he uh, continued to operate the King Tullis <laughs> Riding School up until his retirement in, in 1962. Uh, and so this, this pretty much closes the book on the old barn club, and by pretty much, I mean maybe not quite, because it was about the time that the land was sold that they started building this old stone tower right to the north of where the old barn club had stood. A uh, newspaper article from a, a year after the property was sold, when this tower opened up, it said it would require a year to build is constructed of stone salvaged by the city from condemned buildings. And the only building that I know of that had recently been torn down that contained this much of this type of stone was the old bar club. And so I don't have hard evidence to support this, but I have a, a sneaking suspicion that when you're there in Hills and Dales Park looking at this old tower, you may be very well looking that stone that formed the foundation of this clubhouse that served so many people and held so many parties for over the years. Uh, this, um, this tower is subject to a lot of discussions on local history message boards, uh, people reminiscing about doing things there that they probably shouldn't have done, uh, <laughs> lots of urban legends. Unfortunately, a young lady was killed during a lightning strike there in 1967, so you know, lots of discussion about this tower um, on, 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 online. One thing that I haven't seen mentioned uh, concerns this woman, Millie Bingham. She was a local newspaper columnist. She wrote a column called Ask Millie B that was published in the Date Daily News for many years. She also had a syndicated column under the pseudonym Kate McQueen called Common Sense, Sense with a C. Uh, I had the privilege of being acquainted with her when I was a, a young man. She lived off of, of um, Ridgeway Road there in West Kettering. And in addition to writing, uh, being a journalist, she was also uh, wrote children's mystery stories. Uh, this was published by the Whitman Company, Stories of Suspense, so, so mystery stories for young people. This is the front cover of the book. And this is the back cover of the book. And one of the stories in the book was indeed called The Tower, and it concerned the adventures of, um, of Diane and Peg as they strayed from a party at a picnic shelter at a local park and went over and explored this old stone tower. And I can verify that this story was indeed inspired by that old tower there in Hillsdale's Park. Well, um, it's time to say goodbye to the old barn club. Before we do, we'll sneak up here to the second floor for a look out across Mr. Patterson's sprawling country park, and we will head back out onto West Dorothy Lane and back up the hill and to our modern lives. And so I would like to acknowledge 
these organizations for some of the photos and information that you saw here tonight, especially the Green County Library's online index of big daily news uh, articles, which provided indispensable information to kind of piece this together. So thank you very much for your attention tonight. Please let me know if you have questions. Thank you. Brothers did some gliding off of some of those high hills. In that particular area, I think. Do you know where that was? I haven't heard that. The, 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 there's articles about them having gone down to Vance Road in Moraine, where Vance Road is in Moraine. Okay. They bicycle down there, and that's oh. where they watched uh, the birds. I don't know if they yeah. did for sure any gliding, uh -huh. but they, that's where they did some of their bird watching. Yeah, yeah, where the, the Pinnacles yes. area. Yeah, I've yeah. heard that story. I'm not sure about Hills and Dales Park I because there's so there, many trees in that area. I don't, re I don't remember seeing anything about Hills and Dales Park in the right Yeah. I'm not sure, of course, uh, South Field, Colonel Deeds's field, was not too far from there. And at that time, Inspiration Point was a point you could see from, you can't today. Yeah. It's in the middle of the woods. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And you get no idea of, of what the view would have been like right. from there. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. We, we live on Willow Grove. Yes. Uh, okay. And when you walk up the big hill, then you're up at Adirondack the road. Uh-huh. Okay, and there's a house there. That, that, of course, that, I know it's not tr exactly true. People don't have the story exactly right, but a lot of people in the neighborhood think it had something to do directly with Patterson, you know, like it was some summer home or something. Hmm. Have you know? Uh, I, I can't place anything. I know that he did have a, a summer place a little closer to, uh, oh, what is that, Fairmont Street in, in, in uh, or over there, closer to the Ridgeway Road Bridge. I'm not familiar with anything there, although Sylvester Carr, who has developed Carmont. That's, that's Carmonte. Eh? Yeah. yeah. That's where we live. So uh -huh. when you get up to the top of that hill, um, that's, it sits up there. It used to, the Howers used to oh. own that home. Uh -huh. But it, then it looks down on what would now be uh, the Dayton Country Club. Yeah. So. I, I, I'm not sure. I know Sylvester Carr's home was right in there somewhere, and I haven't been, oh. I'm not sure exactly where it is. I have a picture of it. From, it was in an old newspaper article and profiling some of the important you know, Dayton homes at that time. And uh, looking at it and looking at those houses in there, I'm not sure which one it was. I suspect maybe it was remodeled, but it might have been Sylvester Carr's, oh, okay. who was the developer. He was early president of Dayton Country Club, uh, vice president of the Dayton Sewing Machine Company and you know, oh. a local lawyer. Might have been him, but I, I don't know for sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. First, when it, when it was built, look, everything was cut down, all the, all the hills and so forth. It was all used for agriculture, is that right? That's why you get views like that that have since been allowed to mostly grow back? Um, well, I, I think that a lot of it was clear cut for agriculture, and then there was, yeah, I, I, there was, um, I don't know that on these, some of these hillsides that agriculture would have worked very no. well, but it seemed like they were bare for whatever reason. Maybe I mean, they, they may cut the trees down for fuel and so yeah, too. Yeah, would be my you know, uh, would be a, I, I'm actually you cheating can, a little bit here. This is the, uh, the bluffs. On the that's true. Country. Yeah, that's right. I cheated a little bit here. This is actually the bluffs overlooking Carolyn Park. It's 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 not Hills and Dales Park, by the way. Yeah. But that was one of the, you know another. So area what were the restroom facilities like? I saw lots of campground, but what did they do? <laughs> I presume they had outhouses. I haven't seen anything. I mean, I mean people. They had a lot of people out there. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Oh. Did you ever hear of thunder mugs? <laughs> no. <laughs> a lot of trees. No porta potty. No. Thunder mug. I don't know what a thunder mug is. A thunder mug is is the, what most of us common people call the chamber pot. Okay. Okay. It must be a highfalutin. I don't know what chamber pot is. <laughs> in, any other questions for David? If not, let's thank him again. Oh, thank you so much.